Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Leanne Galuli, and I'm the president of the Boston University Anti-War Coalition. We are a coalition formed as an alliance of students united in support of an end to wars and a nonviolent methods of social change. Our main purpose is to raise awareness through education and to advocate and develop a legislative agenda that promotes our established goals. I would like to start off the evening by sharing some thoughts with you. It is no secret that we live in an extremely complex world and every day society spawns new issues that become increasingly difficult to solve. As technology booms and our collective intelligence expands, limits are replaced with innovations to the likes of which our parents could have never dreamed. Progress has led to an intricately run, consumer-based, mass production society that is showing no signs of slowing down. Yet in our current state of affairs, you do not have to look far to see our economic slowdown, increasing unemployment, or lackluster medical care. The incarceration rate in the United States is among the highest in the world, while energy prices are skyrocketing and our ignorance of the looming climate crisis continues. And of course, there's the quagmire that is Iraq, which everybody seems to recognize as a blunder, yet nobody can seem to find a way out of. Information about Iraq has been stale from the beginning. The mainstream media effectively blacks out gruesome pictures of war and the many actions of the anti-war movement while simultaneously misdirecting the public with lofty rhetoric and distracting them with breaking stories about Britney Spears. There are over 4,000 dead American troops and estimates of anywhere from 80,000 to over 1 million deceased Iraqis, the majority of them civilians. With this war, our government has carried out an assault on our civil liberties, from legalizing and justifying torture of innocent people to openly spying on our citizens. While all along, the military-industrial complex is turning out profit in many different arena, arenas, and top government officials personally profit from government contracts that serve the private companies, such as the prime example of Vice President Cheney's Halliburton. This is all topped off with the mind-numbing redundancies of the presidential campaigns, complete with media distractions, personal attacks, and platforms that leave half our citizens feeling disenfranchised. Considering that this country was founded upon the concept of for the people, by the people, it is dismaying that the public interest in, the, in US policies has drastically fallen over time, while the detrimental effects these policies have in the rest of the world have exponentially grown. How many more transgressions will our unchecked government commit before people get mad? What does it take for those not awake to the urgency of our distress to finally see it? And what does it take for those who are conscious of our ills to feel obliged to fix it? Some argue that it takes a tragedy, yet when tragedy abounds at every page turn of the newspaper, people are desensitized to it. The lack of outrage at the war in Iraq and our burgeoning domestic issues, most notably from my generation, is due to viewing these issues as distant abstractions. Society desperately needs to be dislodged from the complacent backseat of American politics. Our methods of government are punctuated with rudimental grievances that our politicians attempt to mend with band-aids. Being anti-war means a lot more than just desiring an end to this war. What we are really fighting is a system that has led to massive destruction on a global scale and will continue to without upheaval of our ideology and a restructuring of our political system. That is why undeniable parallels between the wars in Iraq and Vietnam can be drawn and why the social movements of the 60s are used as a paradigm for today's revolution. And that is why hate has been perpetuated instead of unqualified love. The great enlightenment of our generation will come, but it will not look like it did in the 60s. We, the current students of America, are faced with the difficult task of having to run this place in the future. Some say that there's simply nothing anybody can do to fix it, that the powers that be are too overwhelming to counter, that public dissent is a thing of the past. Here, I'd like to invoke Margaret Mead, who once said, don't ever tell me that a small group of thoughtful people could not change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We must work within the confines of the structures of society, for in the end, it is simply a game of power politics and social status that, when wisely manipulated, can be utilized to put someone of good intention into power. Yet this ultra-concentrated power is undeniably tainting, and the real challenge lies in combating the culture of greed, bigotry, ignorance, and intolerance that permeates the United States. Because these plights are not identified by our increasing, increasingly unbalanced media, we turn to the unsung heroes who have been the voices of dissent, the forefront of innovative philosophy, and the ones bold and brave enough to question reality. I will never forget the day I first discovered Noam Chomsky. I had inklings that there was something off about the society I've been living in for 18 years, especially considering the war we had begun in Iraq. Feeling overwhelmed in an attempt to locate some facts, I was sifting through media and I came across um, an article Professor Chomsky wrote in December of 2002 and my mind was cracked wide open. 
Part of the article, entitled Modest Proposal, illustrated a persistent pattern of policies that had been occurring for decades and showed no signs of changing. It was as if I had been staring straight at something for years, yet I was actually seeing it for the first time. Mr. Chomsky's work is like a precision laser, whittling down the cumbersome ideologies indoctrinated into the social psyche, exposing and condemning their flawed underbellies. A true renegade, Professor Chomsky has remained one of the most celebrated and highly demanded voices of revolution since he first took a stance in the 60s. Although relentlessly sought after by international media sources, he is often criticized at home in the US. Most widely recognized for his groundbreaking contributions in the field of of linguistics, undergrads cannot take a course in evolutionary psychology, computer science, or international politics without encountering the works of Professor Chomsky. His tall intellect is conditioned with a social consciousness that gives purpose and depth to his works. His flame has been igniting minds and hearts for decades, especially at his beloved school of MIT, where he has taught for the past 53 years. His wisdom is adorned with experience and professed with clarity. Above all else, his individuality is marked by his unique positions, for he has never allowed anybody to put him in a box. Refusing to reside along the established plane of party politics, he has added a dimension to the otherwise horizontal political spectrum. He has taught to dispel preconceived notions, ignore propagandistic headlines, tune out sound bites, fight off your self-serving tendencies, and instead of sharpening differences between one another, recognize the commonalities of man and the potential for justice and peace that exists with, within each being. He has taught to question everything about your reality, to criticize and debate those in power, to find a more human response to the challenges posed by globalization. His ability to think in different modes has allowed for life-changing revelations and has inspired my thinking, and it is my hope that, he, that you all be inspired as well. The future that is at stake is our own, and I believe with intelligent reasoning and original thought, the answers to all these questions can be discovered. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce to you the brilliant author, empowered lecturer, multi-talented, adoring father and doting husband. He's received honorary degrees from over two dozen of the top universities on the planet. He has been called by the New York Times, arguably the most important intellectual alive, and he is among the eight among the eight most cited scholars in history. I could go on for hours about all, the, all his credentials, literally. But ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Professor Noam Chomsky. I don't anticipate living up to that, but uh, <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, modern day American imperialism. Uh, that's a rather challenging task. In fact, uh, talking about American imperialism is a little bit like talking about uh, triangular triangles. Uh, the United States is the one country that exists, as far as I know and ever has, that was founded as an empire explicitly. Uh, according to the Founding Fathers, uh, when the country was founded, it was uh, a nascent empire. That's George Washington. Uh, modern day American imperialism is just uh, a later phase of a process that has continued from the first moment without a break, uh, going in a very steady line. Uh, so we're looking at one phase in a process that was initiated when the country was founded and has never changed. The model for the founding fathers, borrowed from Britain of the, at that time, was the Roman Empire. Uh, and they wanted to emulate it. I'll talk about that a little. Uh, even before the, uh, the revolution, these notions were very much alive. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, 25 years before the revolution, uh, complained to the British that they were imposing limits uh, on the expansion of the colonies. And uh, he uh, objected to this, he borrowing from Machiavelli. Uh, he admonished the British, and quoting him, that uh, a prince that acquires new territories and removes the, native, the natives to give his people room will be remembered as the father of the nation. And George Washington agreed. Uh, he wanted to be the father of the nation. His view was that uh, 
The gradual extension of our settlement will as certainly cause the savage as the wolf to retire, both being beasts of prey, although they differ in shape. Uh, I'll skip some contemporary analogs that you can think of. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the most uh, forthcoming of the founding fathers, uh, said we shall drive them, the savages, we shall drive them with the beasts of the forests into the stony mountains, and the country will ultimately be free of uh, blot or mixture, meaning red or black. It wasn't quite achieved, but that was the goal. Uh, furthermore, uh, Jefferson went on, uh, our new nation will be the nest from which all America, north and south, uh, is to be peopled, uh, displacing not only the red, uh, the red men here, but the uh, Latin, the uh, Spanish-speaking population to the south and anyone else who happened to be around. Uh, there was a deterrent uh, to those uh, glorious aims, uh, mainly Britain, Britain was the most powerful military force in the world at the time, and it uh, did prevent the uh, steps that the founding fathers attempt attempted to take. In particular, it blocked the invasion of Canada. Uh, the first invasion of Canada, attempted invasion of Canada was before the revolution, and there were several others later, but it was always blocked by British force, which is why Canada exists. Uh, the United States did not actually recognize Canada's existence until uh, after the First World War. Uh, another goal that was blocked by British force was uh, Cuba. Uh, the, again, the Founding Fathers regarded the uh, taking over of Cuba as uh, essential to the um, survival of the nascent empire. Uh, but the British fleet was in the way, and they were too powerful, just like the Russians blocked John F. Kennedy's invasions. Uh, the, uh, However, the, uh, they understood that it would, sooner or later, would come. The great grand strategist, uh, John Quincy Adams, the sort of intellectual father of Manifest Destiny, uh, he pointed out in the 1820s that uh, we just have to wait. And they said uh, uh, Cuba will sooner or later fall into our hands by the laws of uh, political gravitation, just as an apple falls from the tree. What he meant is that over time, the United States would become more powerful, uh, Britain would become weaker, and uh, the deterrent would be overcome, uh, which in fact finally happened. And uh, we should not ignore these early events. They are very much related to current history. Uh, that's made very clear by scholarship on uh, uh, current affairs. So the major scholarly work on the Bush Doctrine, George W. Bush Doctrine, uh, the preemptive war doctrine. Uh, major work is by John Lewis Gaddis, who's the, uh, the most respected uh, historian of the uh, Cold War period. It's on the roots of the Bush Doctrine. And he traces it right back to John Quincy Adams, who is his hero, the great grand strategist. Uh, in particular, to uh, 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 Andrew Jackson's invasion of Florida, which conquered Florida from the Spanish. Uh, and that was uh, strongly approved by then Secretary of State Adams in a famous state paper uh, in which he advocated the principle of preemptive war on the basis of the thesis that expansion is the path to security. So if we want to be secure, after all, we want to defend ourselves, we have to expand. Uh, at that time, expand into uh, Florida. We were being threatened by what were called uh, runaway slaves and lawless Indians uh, who uh, were in the way. They were threatening us by their existence, by barring our expansion. Uh, and as Gaddis points out, there's a straight line from that to George Bush. And now expansion is the path to security, it means we take over the world, we take over space, take over the galaxy. There's no limit to how much you have to expand to guarantee security. And that's been the principle from the beginning. Uh, Gaddis is a good historian, and he cites the right sources on the so-called Seminole War, Jackson's conquest of Florida, but he doesn't bother telling us what the sources say, and it's worth looking at what they say. They describe it as a war of uh, 
murder and plunder and extermination, uh, driving out the indigenous population. There were pretexts made, but they were so flimsy that nobody paid much attention to them. It was also the first executive war in violation of the Constitution, setting a precedent which has been followed ever since. There was no congressional authorization. Uh, it's all a lie. Adams lied through his teeth to Congress. I mean, it's all very familiar. So Gaddis is correct. It is the model for the Bush doctrine. He approves of both of them, but that's a moral judgment. Uh, but his analysis is correct. Yes, uh, what's happening now traces right back to the uh, wars of extermination and plunder and murder and uh, lying and deceit and so on, executive wars of that John Quincy Adams was uh, the great uh, 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 spokesman for. Uh, Adams, incidentally, later in his life, uh, uh, regretted this. He, after his own contributions were well in the past, he condemned the Mexican War as an executive war and uh, terrible precedent. It wasn't a precedent. He'd established the precedent. And he also expressed remorse over uh, what he called that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating uh, with such merciless and perfidious cruelty. They knew what they were doing. Uh, contemporary history likes to prettify it, but if you read the uh, descriptions and the observations by the people who were involved, they knew exactly what they were doing. He expressed regret for it, but of course his own role was long past. Uh, well, the, uh, it's commonly argued that uh, American imperialism began in 1898. That's when, uh, in 1898, the U.S. did finally succeed in conquering Cuba, and what's called in the history books, liberating Cuba, and namely intervening in order to prevent Cuba from liberating itself from Spain and turning it into a virtual colony as it remained till. 1959, setting off hysteria in the United States, which hasn't ended yet. Uh, the uh, 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 also conquering, uh, taking over Hawaii, which was stolen by force and guile from its population. Puerto Rico, another colony, uh, soon moving to the Philippines and uh, liberating the Philippines, also liberating a couple of hundred thousand souls to heaven in the process. Uh, and the, again, the reverberations of that extend right to the present with ample state terror and uh, the one corner of Asia that hasn't uh, undergone a high development, uh, something we're not supposed to notice. Uh, but the, uh, the belief that, all, that the imperial thrust started in 1898 is an example of what historians of empire call the salt water fallacy. Uh, the belief that you have an empire if you cross salt water. Uh, in fact, if the uh, Mississippi River were as wide as the Irish Sea, uh, the imperial thrust would have uh, started much earlier. But that's an irrelevance. I mean, expanding over uh, settled territory is no different from expanding over the waters. So what happened in 1898 was just an extension of the process that began when the nascent empire uh, as it saw itself, was formed in its first moments. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, the extension to uh, beyond was, again, a lot of this starts right in New England with New England merchants who wanted to, you know, very eager to uh, take over the Pacific trade, uh, the fabulous uh, markets of China, which were always in their minds, uh, which meant conquering the Northwest, so you can control the ports and so on, meant kicking the British out and others out and so on. That went on from right here. Uh, the goal, as uh, William Seward, who was Secretary of State in the 1860s, pointed out that uh, uh, the uh, central figure in American imperialism, that uh, we have to gain uh, command of the empire of the seas. Uh, we've conquered the continent, we're going to settle, take it over. Monroe Doctrine was a declaration that we'll take it over, everybody else keep out. And the process of doing so continued through the 19th century and beyond until today. Uh, but now we have to have command of the seas. And that meant uh, when the time was ripe, you know, 30 years later, when the apple started to fall from the tree, uh, given relative power, uh, proceeding uh, overseas to the overseas empire. But it's basically no different than 
the earlier steps. The uh, leading uh, philosophical imperialist, Brooks Adams, uh, he uh, pointed out that uh, this is 1895, we were just on the verge of moving overseas extensively, that all Asia must be reduced to our economic system. The Pacific must be turned into an inland sea, just like the Caribbean had been. And there's no reason, he said, why the United States should not become a greater seat of wealth and power than ever was England, Rome, or Constantinople. Well, again, there was a deterrent. Uh, the European powers wanted a piece of the action in East Asia, and Japan by then was a, becoming a formidable force. Uh, so it was necessary to explore more complex modes of uh, gaining command of uh, turning the Pacific into an inland sea and going on. And that was uh, lucidly explained by Woodrow Wilson, who is one of the most brutal and vicious uh, interventionists in American history. The uh, probable permanent destruction of Haiti is one of his many accomplishments. Uh, those of you who study uh, international relations theory or read about it know that there's a notion of Wilsonian idealism. Uh, the fact that that notion can exist is a very interesting commentary on our intellectual culture and scholarly culture. If you look at his actual actions, uh, fine words are easy enough. Uh, but these are some of his fine words, which he was smart enough not to put into print. He just wrote them for himself. He said, since trade ignores national boundaries and the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of his nation must follow, must follow him and the doors of the nations which are closed against him must be battered down, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations be outraged in the process. No useful corner of the world may be overlooked or left, unset, uh, left unused. Well, that's 1907. There's a current version of that, a crude version by Thomas Friedman, uh, who uh, says that uh, McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonnell Douglas, meaning the US Air Force. Uh, well, that's crude version of Wilson's point. You got about batted down the doors by force and threat, and no corner of the world must be left unused, no useful corner. Uh, there was a watershed in this process at the time of the Second World War. Uh, at the time of the Second World War, the US already had by far the largest economy in the world and had for a long time, uh, but uh, it wasn't a major player in world affairs. Britain was the leading player, France second, the United States uh, lagging. It controlled the hemisphere, you know, had made forays into the Pacific, but uh, it was not the leading player. However, during the war, the US planners understood that the war was gonna end with the US, the world dominant power. Uh, however, it turned out other competitors were gonna destroy themselves and each other and the U.S. would be left alone at comparable security. In fact, the U.S. gained enormously from the war. Uh, industrial production virtually quadrupled. Uh, the war ended the Depression. The New Deal measures hadn't done so. Uh, the U.S. ended, at the end of the war, the U.S. had literally half the world's wealth, and competitors were virtually either damaged or, or destroyed. Uh, and. Uh, uh, incomparable security, controlled the Western Hemisphere, controlled both oceans, controlled the opposite side of both oceans, uh, just nothing remotely like it in history. And during the war, uh, planners understood that something like that was going to turn out. It was obvious from the nature of the war. Uh, from 1939 to 1945, there were high-level uh, meetings, regular meetings of the State Department, State Department planners and the Council on Foreign Relations, the sort of main external non-governmental input into foreign policy. And they uh, laid careful plans for the world that they expected to emerge. Uh, it was a world, they said, in which the United States will hold unquestioned power and will ensure the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with US global designs. And so I'm not quoting neocons. You know, I'm quoting the Roosevelt administration, the peak of American liberalism. Uh, the, uh, uh, they called for what they called an integrated policy to achieve military and economic uh, 
supremacy for the United States and bar any exercise of sovereignty by anyone who would interfere with it. And they would do this in a region that they called the Grand Area. Well, in the early part of the war, 1939 to 1943, uh, the Grand Area was defined as uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere routinely, uh, the former British Empire, which the US would take over, uh, and the Far East. That would be the Grand Area. They assumed at the time that there would be a German-led world, the rest, so it would be a non-German world, that's us, and a German world. Uh, as the Russians uh, gradually uh, ground down uh, the Nazi armies uh, after 1942, it became pretty clear that uh, there wouldn't be a German world. Uh, so the Grand Area was expanded to be as much of the world as could be controlled, uh, the uh, uh, limitless. That's simply pursuing the old position that expansion is the path to security uh, for the nascent empire of 1776. Uh, the, uh, 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 these policies were laid down uh, during the war, but then they were implemented right after the war. And in fact, the now that we have available in the declassified record, the uh, planning documents of the late, uh, late 1940s, it turns out they're not very surprisingly, very similar to the uh, wartime planning. Uh, the, one of the leading figures was George Kennan, who was head of the State Department uh, policy planning staff. Uh, he uh, wrote one of his many important uh, papers in 1948, PPS 23, if you want to look it up, uh, uh, noted that the United States has half the world's wealth, but only 6% of its population. And our primary goal in foreign policy must be, as he put it, to maintain this disparity. Uh, and in order to do so, we must put aside all vague and idealistic slogans about democracy and human rights. Uh, those are for public propaganda and colleges and so on. But we must put those aside and uh, keep to pure power concepts. There will be no other way to maintain the disparity. And then in the same paper and elsewhere, he and his staff uh, went through the world, uh, assigned to each part of the world uh, what would be what they called its function within this uh, global system that, in which the US would have uh, uh, unchallenged uh, power, unquestioned power. So Latin America and the Middle East, uh, the Middle East obviously would provide the energy resources that we would control, gradually pushing out Britain throwing out France immediately and pushing out Britain slowly over the years and turning it into essentially a, a junior partner as the British Foreign Office uh, ruefully described their role at that time. Uh, the uh, uh, Latin America we simply control. It's uh, our little region over here which has never bothered anyone as uh, uh, Secretary of War Stimson said while the US was violating the principles it was establishing by setting up a regional uh, organization in violation of the UN Charter and so on. Uh, so Latin America we keep, Middle East we control. Uh, Southeast Asia uh, would uh, be, its function was to provide uh, resources and raw materials to the former colonial powers. Uh, uh, meanwhile, we would purchase them too. That would send dollars there, which the colonial powers would take, not the population. And they could use those to Britain, France, Netherlands, could use the dollars to purchase US manufacturers. It's called a triangular trading arrangement, uh, which would allow the US had the only really functioning industrial system in the world, had a huge uh, excess of manufacturing products, and there was what was called a dollar gap. The countries we wanted to sell it to didn't have dollars. Uh, and that's Europe, basically. So we had to provide them with dollars, and the role of function of Southeast Asia was to play a role in that, hence the support for French colonialism and recapturing its Indo-Chinese colony and so on. It's, uh, there was various variations, but that's the basic story. Uh, the, uh, 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 and so Kennan went through the world and signed them its function, each part. When he got to Africa, uh, he uh, decided that the United States really didn't have much interest in Africa at that time, and therefore we should hand it over to the Europeans uh, to exploit, it's his word, to exploit for their reconstruction. He said it would also give them a kind of a psychological lift after the uh, 
damage of the war and while we were taking over all of their uh, domains. Uh, well, you, you could imagine a different relationship between Europe and Africa in the light of history, but that couldn't even be considered. I mean, it was like too outlandish to discuss and still is. So Africa was to be exploited by Europe for its reconstruction, which consequences we know. The U.S. has since gotten into the act. Well, that was Kennan. Uh, he was removed from office soon after because he was considered too soft-hearted, uh, not <laughs> up to dealing with this harsh world, and he was replaced with real tough guys, uh, Dean Acheson, uh, Paul Nitze, and others, and there's no time to go through it, but if you ever want an education on hysterical jingoist fanaticism, uh, you really should read uh, their documents uh, if you've studied these issues. You've heard of at least NSC 68, which is discussed by everyone, but its rhetoric is omitted. And you have to look at its rhetoric to see what's going on in these crazed heads of the great thinkers. Uh, uh, and this is true of the whole National Security Council culture. There's a wonderful book on it that came out a couple of years ago by uh, James Peck, a sinologist who called Washington's China. There's the first scholarly book to go through the whole national security culture. And it's like reading a collection of madmen, you know, but it's, uh, worth, it's very much worth studying, much more worth studying than most of what people study in their courses on these issues. Well, anyway, that's, uh, uh, what, what do we do about Latin America? The, the one we just, nobody has, you know, it's our domain. Well, Kennan was pretty explicit about that too. He said in Latin America, we should prefer police states uh, the reason is, and he said, that harsh government measures of repression should cause no qualms as long as the results are on balance uh, favorable to our interests, in particular as long as we guarantee the protection of our resources. Uh, the re our resources happen to be somewhere else, but that's a historical accident. They're our resources, and we have to protect them. And if you have to do it by the mailed fist, okay, that's the way you do it. Uh, as I say, he was removed. Uh, the, uh, there is a long, ugly history. There's no time to go through it, but the Cold War history essentially follows this pattern. Uh, the Cold War was a kind of a, you know, a tacit compact between uh, the, the, the superpower and, its, and the smaller power, the United States and Russia. Uh, the compact was that the United States would be free to carry out uh, violence and terror and atrocities uh, limitless in its own domains, and the Russians would be able to run their own dungeon without too much U.S. interference. Uh, so the Cold War, in effect, was a war of the United States against the Third World and of Russia against its much smaller domains in Eastern Europe. And the events of the Cold War illustrate that. Uh, each great power used the other's threats as a pretext for repression and violence and destruction. The United States way more than Russia, if you look at the record, uh, reflecting its, their relative power. Uh, but that's essentially the picture. Uh, you can uh, see the, uh, in fact, for the United States, the war was basically a, a war against, the Cold War was a war of, uh, basically a war against uh, uh, independent nationalism in the third world, uh, what was called radical nationalism. The radical means doesn't follow orders. Uh, so uh, it's a constant struggle against radical nationalism, in particular the uh, a leading thesis all the way through is that even the smallest place, if it becomes independent, is a serious danger. It's what uh, Henry Kissinger called a, a virus that might infect others, like even a tiny place, you know, Grenada or something. Uh, if, if it has successful independent development, uh, others might get the idea that we can follow, the rot will spread, as Atchison put it, so you've got to stamp it out uh, right at the source. Uh, it's not a novel idea, any mafia don will explain it to you. Uh, the godfather does not tolerate it when some small storekeeper doesn't pay protection money, not that he needs the money, but it's kind of like a bad idea, others might get the idea. Uh, and in particular, small, weak countries have to be, we have to crush them with particular violence uh, so that others, because there it's easy, you know, nobody can stop you, and others get the point. Uh, that's a large part of international affairs uh, right to the present. Well, to learn about what the Cold War was about, the obvious place to look is what happened when it ended. 
Okay, so no, November 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, Soviet Union soon collapsed. Uh, so what did the United States do? How did it react? I mean, the pretext for everything that had happened in the past was you know, the Russian monster, the uh, monolithic and ruthless conspiracy attempting to take over the world, as John F. Kennedy called it. Well, now the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy was gone. So what do we do? Uh, well, what turns out what we do is exactly the same thing, but with different pretexts. And that was made clear instantly. Uh, a couple of weeks after the Berlin, Berlin Wall fell, the United States invaded Panama, uh, killing unknown numbers of people. We don't count our victims, according to Panamanian human rights groups, maybe a couple of thousand people uh, bombing the uh, slum, El Chirio slum. Uh, the Panamanians take this seriously. In fact, last December, they once again declared a national day of mourning uh, uh, about the, uh, referring to the invasion. I don't even think it made the newspapers here. I mean, when you crush ants in your path, you don't pay much attention to their, uh, you know, what they may have to say about it. Uh, but they invaded Panama, had to veto some Security Council resolutions. Uh, the point of the invasion was to kidnap a, uh, a kind of a minor thug, uh, Noriega, who was kidnapped, brought to the United States, uh, tried, sentenced, long sentence, a sentence for crimes that were real, uh, but he had committed them when he was on the CIA payroll, almost without exception, a uh, small footnote. Uh, so, uh, but, but for that, we had to invade Panama and kill however many people it was, a couple of thousand probably, and uh, install a government of uh, bankers and narco traffickers, uh, drug trafficking shut up and so on. Uh, but it was a successful invasion and applauded here. Uh, it was kind of a footnote to history. That's the kind of thing the U.S. does in its domains all the time. But it was a little different. Uh, for one thing, the pretexts were different. Uh, this time it wasn't we were defending ourselves against the Russians. Uh, it was we were defending ourselves against the Hispanic narco traffickers who were going to come and you know, shoot up our kids and destroy the country and so on. And in fact, uh, Noriega was a minor narco trafficker who had mostly been working for the CIA. But uh, uh, he became unacceptable when he started dragging his feet on following orders, like he didn't participate uh, enthusiastically enough in the uh, U.S. terrorist war against Nicaragua and so on. So he obviously had to go. Well, one difference uh, was that it had different pretexts. Another was that the United States was much freer to act. Uh, that was pointed out right away by Elliot Abrams, who's now after uh, he's now uh, back in office running Middle East affairs. Uh, he pointed out right away that uh, the invasion of Panama was different from what had preceded because we didn't have to be concerned about the Russians stirring up trouble somewhere in the world. We were free to use force without impediment. Uh, and uh, correct observation counts goes on right until today. Many of the uh, violent acts that the U.S. has carried out since then, it would have hesitated seriously about if there was a deterrent. But now there are no deterrents anymore, so you do what you like. Uh, that was a change. Uh, the, uh, uh, again, if you want to learn more about what the Cold War was about, have a look at the documents that were produced right afterwards. Uh, this is George Bush the first. Uh, right after the early 1990, gave us a new budget request, there was a new national security strategy, and they described what the post-Cold War world would be. Turns out, exactly as before. Uh, we still have to have a huge, massive military force, uh, but we have to maintain uh, what they call the defense industrial base. Uh, that's a euphemism for high-tech industry. Uh, and, you know, for the public and so on. You talk about our belief in free trade and free enterprise and so on. But anyone who knows anything about the U.S. economy knows it's based on the state, extensively on the state sector. Uh, High-tech industry is very largely uh, within the state sector and it's under a government, it's under, typically under a Pentagon cover as long as it's electronics based. So, and that's called the defense industrial base. So we have to maintain the huge public subsidy to high-tech industry called the defense industrial base. Uh, we have to have a massive military, but it has different targets. Uh, the, as they pointed out before this, uh, we were aimed at a, uh, a, a weapons-rich uh, target, namely Russia. Now uh, we're aiming at a target-rich region, namely the third world. 
they don't have any weapons, but there are a lot of rich targets there. So that's what we need the major military forces for. In fact, that's pretty much what it was in the past, too, but now it's openly conceded. Uh, we have to, uh, 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 with regard to the Middle East specifically, uh, we have to maintain intervention forces directed at the Middle East. And then comes this interesting comment. Uh, we need the same intervention forces directed at the Middle East uh, where the uh, problems that we faced could not, be late, could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. Okay, so sorry folks, we've been lying to you for the last 50 years claiming we're defending ourselves against the Russians. But now that the Russians aren't there, it turns out the problems couldn't have been laid at the Kremlin's door, which is correct. The problems were independent nationalism and they continue to be so, but now it's said open and clear because the pretext is gone. Uh, uh, we also we have to also be concerned now about what they call the technological sophistication of third world powers. It's a really overwhelming threat. It's kind of like Hillary Clinton a day or two ago saying that uh, if Iran attacks Israel with nuclear weapons, uh, we'll obliterate Iran. And the chance of Iran attacking Israel with nuclear weapons is somewhere below an asteroid hitting Israel, but it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a nice throwaway line. Uh, but, uh, but that's the kind of threat we have to worry about. It's kind of like Ronald Reagan in 1985 strapping on his cowboy boots and uh, declaring a state of national emergency because uh, of the threat posed to the national security of the United States by the government of Nicaragua. Uh, which was only two days away from Harlingen, Texas. So we really had to tremble in terror. You know? uh, well, that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's standard. It, it had to increase after the end of the Cold War with the main pretexts gone, and it, and it has. Uh, the, uh, 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 this uh, is, also, is all consistent with a conception of a, a conception of aggression that has developed through the period and right up till today. It's very lively today. Uh, regression, uh, aggression has a meaning, you know, but that meaning doesn't apply to us. Uh, the, uh, uh, by, the, by U.S. leaders, aggression means resistance. So anyone who resists the United States is guilty of aggression. And that makes sense if we own the world, you know, so any act of resistance is aggression against us. So when the U.S. invaded South Vietnam in the early 1960s under Kennedy, uh, Kennedy said we're defending ourselves against what he called the assault from within. And uh, the leading liberal light, Adlai Stevenson, uh, described it as indirect internal aggression. So internal aggression by South Vietnamese against us, and of course we're there by right because we own the world. Uh, the, and and that, uh, uh, that continues uh, right to the present, so uh, let's skip a lot of time because nothing much changed and come right up till today. Uh, so the big problem of the Middle East now, read the Washington Post a couple of days ago, is uh, uh, the growing aggressiveness of Iran. Uh, that's what's causing the problems of the Middle East. Well, you know, aggression has a meaning. It means sending your armed forces into the territory of some other state. Uh, where, when the latest case of Iranian aggression was a couple of centuries ago, uh, unless we count Iranian aggression that was carried out under the Shah, which we approved of, the tyrant who we imposed, conquered a couple of Arab islands, but that was okay. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to defend ourselves against Iranian aggression uh, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Gaza where Iran is carrying out aggression, meaning people there are doing things we don't like, and Russia isn't around, so we'll blame it on Iran. Uh, that's aggression. Uh, and uh, there's, even, there's a lot of discussion about, about uh, aggression inside Iraq, uh, carried out by the renegade cleric, uh, Muqtad al-Sadr. If you read the press, you might get the idea that Muqtada's first name is renegade. Uh, it's hardly a phrase, that, uh, a reference to him that doesn't talk about the renegade Muqtada al-Sadr. Why is he a renegade? Well, he opposes the U.S. invasion of his country. Okay, that makes him a renegade, or a radical, obviously. And that's routine. Nobody questions that. It's kind of like reflexive uh, description. Uh, Condoleezza Rice was asked a little while ago on uh, a uh, TV interview, uh, how could we end the war in Iraq? Uh, 
and she said it's a very easy way to end the war. She said it's quite obvious. Stop the flow of arms to foreign fighters. Stop the flow of foreign fighters across the border. That'll end the war in Iraq. Well, you know, if, if somebody was looking at this who hadn't been adequately brainwashed by a good Western education, uh, they would collapse in ridicule. I mean, yes, there are foreign fighters in Iraq and plenty of foreign arms in there, namely from the country that invaded Iraq. But they're not foreign, remember? They're indigenous because we're indigenous everywhere. That follows from owning the world, uh, going back to the nascent empire it's spread. So therefore, we're not foreign fighters there or anywhere else. Uh, we're indigenous, and it's the foreign fighters who have to be stopped. Uh, on, uh, uh, and uh, actually, the concept of aggression uh, has expanded recently. There's a couple of, back in January, you may have seen, there was an important statement by five former NATO commanders, uh, which uh, uh, was reported. The big issue was that they had said, we have to base our uh, uh, military posture on possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, but it's nothing new. It's always been true. It was strongly advocated by the Clinton administration, but uh, much stronger terms, in fact. Uh, but that was what was reported. However, it was interesting was, and the one thing that was new, was their expans expansion of the concept acts of war. They said acts of war against which we must have must defend ourselves by the use of nuclear weapons, if necessary, uh, is using weapons of finance. Okay, so if a country uses weapons of finance against us, that's an act of war, and we have to be ready to use nuclear weapons uh, if necessary. Well, two months after, in late March, uh, the United States Treasury Department warned the world's financial institutions against any dealing with Iran's uh, state-owned banks. Now, those warnings have teeth, thanks to the Patriot Act. A little noticed element of the Patriot Act uh, permits the United States to bar from access to the United States financial system uh, any uh, country that violates its orders, meaning if a German or a Chinese or other bank uh, tries to have dealings with Iran, they can be barred from the U.S. financial system which is a cost that very few are willing to bear and might, and it could, and uh, uh, is in fact a declaration of war uh, and by the uh, judgment of the five NATO commanders, uh, an act of war uh, against which uh, Iran is entitled to respond uh, any way it likes, uh, perhaps with nuclear weapons or terror or whatever, uh, uh, according to these judgments. Now, you'll notice that there's a serious logical fallacy in what I've just been saying. It overlooks uh, two fundamental principles, which are the crucial principles of world order. The rest is footnotes. Uh, the first principle is that we own the world and Iran doesn't. And so therefore, the principles don't apply to us. They only apply to others. And uh, kind of a corollary to that is that everything we do is necessarily with the best of intentions. Now that's a tautology. You don't have to give evidence or arguments. Uh, and that's a constant feature of the intellectual culture, almost without exception, across the spectrum. Uh, so, for example, during the uh, invasion of uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, I, don't, I hope I don't have to describe it to you, but it, it killed several million people, uh, destroyed three countries. Uh, it's just a monstrous atrocity. Uh, but, and it was, if you, if you look over the, there was vast discussion of it, mainstream discussion, but if you look closely, you'll find that there was never a principled critique of the war. That was not permissible. Uh, the uh, typical, just to keep to the kind of left critical end, and the rest gets worse. At the end of the war, uh, Anthony Lewis of the New York Times uh, wrapped it up. Uh, he said, uh, speaking from the left liberal extreme, that the United States uh, entered the war with uh, blundering efforts to do good. Uh, notice, efforts to do good is a tautology. We did it, so therefore it's efforts to do good. So it's not saying anything. Blundering, because it didn't work as well as they wanted, at least. Worked pretty well, but not as well as they wanted. So we started with blundering efforts to do good, but by 1969, uh, it was clear that uh, we could not establish democracy in South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. Uh, 
well established democracy in South Vietnam is on a par with some Soviet commissar saying that Stalin was trying to establish democracy in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, but that doesn't matter. It's us, so we, so we were doing. Uh, and, but, the, but the problem with it was the cost to us. Okay? So that meant we had to sort of start pulling out. Well, that's the critique at the very left end. I'll take one more example. The leading American liberal historian, maybe the most famous historian of his generation, Arthur Schlesinger, who was at first a super hawk, like the whole Kennedy administration was, uh, no alternative to victory in, in their invasion of South Vietnam, which is what it was. Uh, but by the late 60s, he was having second thoughts, and he wrote a, a book uh, expressing them. And he said that, uh, uh, he said, we all pray that the hawks will be correct in hoping that the surge of the day, a big influx of troops, will be successful. And if they are, uh, we will be praising the wisdom and statesmanship of the American government uh, in winning the war, and he was aware of what it was. He said, leaving a land of wreck and ruin with its institutions destroyed may never recover. But we'll nevertheless be praising the wisdom and the statesmanship of the American government, and we pray that they're right, the Hawks. But he said they probably aren't right. It's probably going to be too costly for us. Uh, no question about the cost to the Vietnamese, I mean, land of wreck and ruin. Uh, so therefore, maybe we ought to rethink it. Well, that's the criticism at the critical end of the spectrum, the dovish critical end. Then from there on over to the jingoist end of the spectrum, you have a kind of a debate. Uh, could we have won with more force, or was it a lost cause anyway, and so on. It's rather striking that the population is out of this. So in 1969, the year that Lewis pointed to, 70% of the population thought that the war was uh, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Uh, try to find anything in the literature of educated sectors that says it was anything but a mistake, that it was fundamentally wrong and immoral. Uh, that's not unusual. Uh, internally, the government was aware of this. Uh, one of the things that is not taught but should be read, because it's very illuminating, is the final part of the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers are not declassified archives. They are stolen archives, so we know a better idea what, what they were thinking. Uh, the Pentagon Papers end in 1968, right after the Tet Offensive in January 1968, which convinced the business world that this is going to cost us too much. We better start uh, winding it down. Uh, there was a request uh, uh, from the government to send another couple hundred thousand troops to Vietnam, but they were dubious about doing it and didn't do it finally because they were fa afraid uh, that there would be an uprising in the United States, a popular uprising of unprecedented proportions, and they would need the troops for civil disorder control uh, because of protests among uh, underprivileged people, women, uh, youth, and others who just weren't going to take anymore. Well, that tells you that they were, that they didn't admit that they were listening, but they were, and they always do. Uh, if they, needed the troops for control, and they sort of slowly started backing off. Another six years of war you know, devastated uh, Laos and Cambodia and much of Vietnam, but at least they started winding down. Well, that was 1969. Uh, notice that you can take the rhetoric about the Vietnam War and translate it almost verbatim into discussion of the Iraq War. There is no principled critique within the mainstream, and nobody can by principled critique, I mean the kind of critique that we would carry out reflexively and do uh, when somebody else commits aggression. Let's say when the Russians invade Czechoslovakia or uh, uh, Afghanistan or Chechnya, uh, we don't ask, is it too costly? In fact, it wasn't costly at all. It practically killed nobody in uh, Czechoslovakia, Chechnya, after reducing the place to ruin. Uh, apparently, it's functioning pretty well. In fact, if, uh, according to Western correspondence, if David Petraeus could achieve anything in Iraq like what the Putin achieved in Chechnya, he'd probably be crowned king or something like that. Uh, but nevertheless, we condemn it, rightly. Uh, doesn't matter whether it worked or not or whether it was costly to them or not. Or when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, killing probably a, a fraction of the number of people that uh, Bush killed a couple of months earlier when he invaded Panama. But we nevertheless denounce it as aggression. You know, no, that's a principled objection. But when we carry out aggression, it's inconceivable. Yeah. And that goes back to the 
principles that I mentioned, we own the world, and everything we do is, by definition, good in intention. So the worst that it can be is uh, what Barack Obama calls a strategic blunder, or what uh, Hillary Clinton calls uh, getting into a civil war which uh, we can't win. In fact, Iraqis overwhelmingly blame the civil war on us, but that's irrelevant too. Uh, that's the level of critique, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's and it follows from uh, you know from the uh, principles that I mentioned, and it it governs news coverage too. In fact, pretty openly. Uh, here's John Burns, who's the you know, dean of correspondence, the most senior, most respected correspondent. Uh, in Iraq after a long, uh, long career. Uh, he says that uh, uh, the, United, uh, the United States uh, is the prominent economic, uh, political, and military power in the world and has been the greatest force for stability in the world, certainly since World War II. It would be a dark day if the outcome in Iraq were to destroy the credibility of American power to destroy America's willingness to use its power in the world to achieve good, to fight back against totalitarianism, authoritarianism, gross human rights abuses. Okay, in other words, that's the framework of reporting. Reporting must be cheering for the home team. Nothing else is conceivable uh, because of the depth of these principles which are instilled into people in the educational system and propaganda. You can't see the world in any other terms. So it's neutral, objective reporting to say we're cheering for the home team. And it's quite open. That's interesting that he said it so clearly, but uh, he says that's particularly true, he says, in the Middle East. But notice that it makes not the slightest difference what the people of the world or the Middle East think. That's not relevant. Or for that matter, what the people in the United States think. Uh, so the, uh, the Vietnam War was uh, benign efforts to do good, which were too costly to us, even when 70% of the population has said that's fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. The population here is as irrelevant as the population in the rest of the world. Unless you're frightened of them, yeah. and you have to keep your troops here for civil disorder control. Uh, what, what do people think? Well, what people think we know from international polls that are regularly taken. They think that the United States is the most frightening dangerous country in the world, not John Burns' line. Uh, what about the, uh, and there's overwhelming opposition to U.S. force, just almost everywhere. Uh, the, uh, it's also true of the Middle East, and there's nothing new about it. Uh, so George, our current George Bush, after 9-11, uh, asked uh, why do they hate us, and went on, they hate our freedoms, and so on, you remember that. Uh, what the press should have reported is that he was just repeating a question that uh, President Eisenhower asked in 1958. Uh, Eisenhower asked his staff, why is there a campaign of hatred against us among the people of the Middle East? And the National Security Council, the highest planning agency, had provided an answer. He said the people in the Middle East, uh, cons their perception is that the United States uh, supports uh, brutal tyrannies, and blocks democracy and development, and does so because we want control of their oil. And then they went on to say, yeah, perception is more or less correct, and that's the way it ought to be. Uh, so therefore, there's a campaign of hatred against us. And so it continues. Uh, after 9-11, the Wall Street Journal, to its credit, uh, conducted some polls in the Middle East. They didn't care about the general population, what's uh, demeaningly called the Arab street. Uh, they polled uh, what they called moneyed Muslims bankers, uh, managers of multinational corporations, uh, you know, kind of guys we like. Uh, and they found pretty much the same thing as 1958. Uh, there's a camp, it's not, they don't have any objection to neoliberalism or any of this stuff. In fact, they love it. Uh, but they uh, condemn the United States for supporting uh, harsh, uh, tyrannical regimes, which it does, and opposing democracy and development, which it does. Uh, because we want to control their uh, energy resources. And by uh, 2001, they had other objections, namely uh, Israel's US-backed uh, uh, vicious repression and dispossession of Palestinians, which is ongoing, uh, and also the sanctions against Iraq. Uh, the sanctions against Iraq didn't get much play here, uh, 
because we don't pay attention to our crimes. That's crucial. Uh, that's part of the principle that everything we do is good. Uh, but they do pay attention. Uh, and uh, in fact, we know a lot about them, or we can if we want to. Uh, there were uh, uh, two directors of the oil for food program, supposedly the humanitarian part of the sanctions. Uh, both of them resigned uh, because they regarded the sanctions as genocidal, uh, uh, carrying out a huge massacre of uh, the population. Uh, the Clinton administration would not permit them to transmit their uh, information to the Security Council, which was technically responsible. And the, the media agree. The, sec the uh, spokesman for the State Department, James Burns, said that, referred to Hans von Sponek, the second of them, as uh, he said, this man in Baghdad is paid to work, not to talk. And the press agrees and scholarship agrees, so they're suppressed. Uh, they knew more about Iraq than any other Westerner. They had hundreds of observers running around the country sending back reports. But you can do a Google search and find out how often they were allowed to speak in the United States in the run-up to the war, for that matter, since. Uh, Fon Sponek, right, and, uh, who's a very distinguished international diplomat, wrote a book about it uh, about two years ago called A Different Kind of War. I don't think there's a reference to it in the United States, let alone a review. We do not want to publicize our genocidal actions. But people of the Middle East noticed and didn't like it, and that increased the campaign of hatred among the moneyed Muslims, our friends there. Don't have to think about the others. Uh, but it doesn't matter what they think. Uh, the uh, uh, same is true of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the Iraqis regard it as worse than the Mongol invasions. It's the great successes. Uh, Iraq may never recover. I mean, uh, you know, the great success story of Petraeus uh, is. Uh, uh, to establish uh, warlord armies, which will probably tear the country up in the future, and also to turn, say, Baghdad. It's true that violence in Baghdad has declined, uh, partly because there are fewer people to kill. You know, there's been massive ethnic, ethnic cleansing, and that's been accelerated by the Petraeus strategy of building essentially walled communities. Uh, it's a comment by Nir Rosen, who's one of the two or three journalists who actually reports seriously from Iraq. Uh, he, he speaks Arabic fluently, and he looks Arab, so he can get around easily, he travels all over, not with uh, armed guards and you know, Abrams tanks and so on. Uh, he says, uh, talking about Baghdad recently, he says, looming, on the, looming over the homes in the district he's looking at are 12-foot high walls built by the Americans to confine people to their own neighborhood emptied and destroyed by civil war, which the U.S. fomented, uh, 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 walled off by the surge. Uh, sections of the city feel more like a desolate, post-apocalyptic maze of concrete tunnels than a living, inhabited neighborhood. Uh, they're controlled by separation walls and, in fact, by the increasing use of air power, uh, but uh, a little quieter, so therefore the uh, uh, critics having no principled criticism don't talk about it much. Uh, well, what does the public think about all these things? Uh, well, we know about Iraq. The public wants to get out, but they're irrelevant. What about Iran? Uh, the next major crisis looming, which will make Iraq look like a tea party if they go through with it. Uh, there are opinions about this. Uh, there's the opinion of uh, American elites, which you can read, say, in the New York Times or Washington Post, or liberal journals, and so on. They'll tell you that Iran is defying the world by enriching uranium. Well, exactly who is the world? OK, well, we can find out. Uh, there is an organization called G77, 130 countries. It includes the vast majority of the people of the world. They vigorously support uh, Iran's right to uh, uh, all the rights guaranteed by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, including enriching uranium for nuclear power. So they're not part of the world, okay? Now what about the American population? An overwhelming majority of the American population agrees with G77, namely that uh, Iran should have the right to uh, produce nuclear energy, but not nuclear weapons. So the American population is not part of the world. So Non-aligned countries are not part of the world. You know, American population is not part of the world. Obviously, Iranians are not part of the world. So uh, who's left? Well, the world consists of people who follow Washington's orders. 
you can't say it includes the United States because the overwhelming majority of Americans are not part of the world. They oppose this, uh, just as on many other issues. And that goes on without comment, you know, correctly if uh, we're cheerleaders for the home team. And that's the framework for discussion. Uh, is there a solution to the crisis with Iran, which is extremely serious? If the U.S. goes through with its plans, parent plans, uh, you know, like I said, it might look, make Iraq look like a tea party. Uh, well, there are solutions, potential solutions. Uh, one of them is what I just said, that Iran should have the rights of any signer of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, Israel, Pakistan, and India also ought to have those rights if they sign the treaty. Since they haven't done it, they don't have those rights. But of course, they're doing it because we say it's OK. Uh, the, uh, uh, but that's the opinion of the large majority of Americans. And uh, the uh, same large majority, this runs around 75%, uh, says that a nuclear weapons-free zone should be established in the region, including Iran, Israel, American forces deployed there, and so on. Well, that would end the crisis. Uh, is that possible? Well, it's supported by the large majority of Americans, but as I mentioned, they're not part of the world. It's Iran's official policy, but they're not part of the world. Uh, the U.S. and Britain are formally committed to it, in fact, more so than any other powers, for a very simple reason, which we would read about if we had a free press. Uh, when the United States and Britain went to war with Iraq and tried to find a thin legal cover for it, they appealed to UN Security Council Resolution 687, uh, 1991, which uh, ordered Iraq to get rid of its weapons of mass destruction. And as you remember, Britain and the United States claimed they hadn't lived up to it. Well, you, you know, you're all literate. You can read Resolution 687. It commits the United States and Britain to work to establish a nuclear-free weapons zone in the Middle East. Okay, so if you can appeal to it as a justification for aggression, you're, you're compelled to follow its, uh, its provisions. But to point that out would be really to break the rules. And you can, again, do a Google search and see if you can find anyone anywhere near the mainstream who's ever bothered to point this out. Uh, another way to uh, move towards a solution would be to end the threats against Iran. Uh, the threats, if anyone cares, are a violation of the UN Charter, but for outlaw states, that's irrelevant. Uh, again, the large majority of the American population thinks we should end the threats and move to normal diplomatic relations with Iran. Well, if these steps were taken, the crisis would essentially be over. Uh, so we can ask, who's defying the world if the world includes its people? You know, including the American people? And the answer is very simple and straightforward. Uh, those who are defying the world are the ones in power in Washington and in London and in the editorial offices and the university faculties and so on. They're defying the world, uh, but uh, not Iran, not on these issues. And in fact, it's a serious matter uh, because it could lead to total disaster. And the same is true on other issues. So the other major live issue in the Middle East uh, is Israel-Palestine. Well, what does the world think about this? Uh, there is an international consensus uh, supported by about two-thirds of the American population, uh, supported by former non-aligned countries, uh, supported by the Arab world, formally at least supported by Europe, uh, obviously Latin America. In fact, everyone. Iran supports it. The Hamas supports it. It's for a two-state settlement, two-state settlement on the international borders with, meaning pre-June 67 borders, with minor modifications. Uh, who opposes that? Well, for the last 30 years, uh, the United States has opposed it, and it continues to oppose it. Uh, and Israel, of course, opposes it, though it, if the U.S. would support it, Israel would necessarily go along. So the problem is right in Washington. Uh, this begins in uh, 1976, when the U.S vetoed the first Security Council resolution calling for a settlement in these terms. It was introduced by the Arab states, uh, backed by the PLO. Actually, it even goes back earlier to 1971, when President Sadat of Egypt offered Israel a full peace treaty uh, in return for withdrawal from <coughs> occupied territories. He, what he cared is withdraw about was withdrawal from the Sinai, where Israel was kicking out thousands of peasants and settling. Uh, Israel, he didn't say anything about the Palestinians. They were not an issue at the time. Uh, Israel recognized it as a genuine peace offer and decided to reject it. They made a fateful decision preferring expansion to security. 
peace treaty with Israel would have ended security problems, Egypt would have ended security problems. The important question is what would happen in the United States? You know, the, the godfather. Well, uh, Kissinger uh, managed, there was a battle, in the, a bureaucratic internal battle in the United States. Kissinger won, uh, he, and the US followed his policy, which he called stalemate, meaning no negotiations, just force, okay? That set the stage for the 1973 war and on to a whole list of horrors since. And up till today, the United States and Israel are, have been leading the rejectionist camp. By now, they are the rejectionist camp, not the U.S. population, but the government. Uh, so who's defying the world on this issue? Is there a possible settlement? Sure there is, but uh, it resides here. In fact, on issue after issue, uh, the major problems uh, happen to be right here, uh, which is a very optimistic conclusion uh, because it means that we can do something about it. It's here that we can have an influence, not elsewhere. I'll stop. say that you were the most important intellectual alive, and you know that well. It was merely an outsider, a professor at Stanford, who said it in a review which appeared in the New York Times. Interestingly enough, you've used that quote on several of your books, also a fabricated quote. You've also said that whenever that arises during an introduction like tonight, you always say something about it and correct it. And that's, of course, a falsehood because you didn't do it here tonight. And that's happened in the past also. Number two. I couldn't help but notice the reference to Arthur Schlesinger. Apparently, you still uh, something sticking in your craw about your bout with him. I guess it was around 1970, in which he exposed you for fabricating some Harry Truman quotes. That was the uh, exchange in which he dubbed you an intellectual crook. So I guess that's still sticking in your craw even now. And finally, as to this notion of cheering for the home team, which obviously you don't do. There's somebody else you're cheering for. So I'd like you to be very forthright, like some leftists do, who say they are cheering for our opponents in various places around the world, quite clearly. Do you have the courage to tell us right now that you are pulling against us in Iraq and Afghanistan, that you're hoping we fail, that you support the terrorists, or you might call them freedom fighters, hoping they kill Americans? Oh, we get the point, yeah. Uh, can I go through these points? Uh, on the first one, uh, the quote, it was not by uh, somebody interviewed, it was by a reviewer in the New York Times. He was interviewed. He wasn't, it. you said he was interviewed. I did not say that, listen up. You did, but it doesn't matter. It was a book review. It was a book review, right. And it, you know, it's true that I didn't bother to correct it tonight, but I almost always do it because it's funny. It's a very funny thing. Uh, what he actually said is, uh, he's the most important intellectual in the world, how can he write such terrible things about US foreign policy? Uh, I like that quote. So I invariably, not either. I invariably correct it. You say you see it on the backs of books. If you take a look at the publishing industry, you'll find that the author has absolutely no control over what appears in blurbs, uh, nothing. Uh, if, if I had a choice, I'd tell them not to use it, of course, and I often do, but they like to use it, and then I correct it when it's brought up. That's, because I'll, I think the actual quote is quite interesting. Uh, so that's one. As for Schlesinger, uh, you've got the story backwards. I criticized Schlesinger on these points in, the, in a book that appeared in 1969, which he was furious about. And in his review of that book, which was a furious review, he tried to find some error, and he found an absolutely trivial error, so small that it was corrected two months later in the second printing. But, it, but he's been screaming about it. He's screamed about it ever since, and people like you do too. The error was that in quoting a speech by Harry Truman, okay, 
uh, instead of quoting his actual speech, I quoted a virtually verbatim paraphrase of it by a leading uh, respected commentator, James Warburg. So the words were slightly different, though the content was exactly the same. As I say, it was so trivial, it was corrected two months later in the second printing. It's a rare book that doesn't have some small error. Uh, but yes, you know, the, the defenders of uh, state violence are desperate, and if they can find anything that they can point to, uh, they'll run with it forever. So that's the truth about the second point. As for the cheering, uh, you heard what I said, and it's what I've written. I think we should pay attention to the population, okay? Population of the United States, population of Iraq, population of the world. Uh, we should pay attention to what they think. Of course, those who are you know, supporters of state violence think we shouldn't. We should pay attention to the guys in power and to the uh, sort of... Uh, a cheering section that, uh, among the intellectuals that supports them. Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, if, uh, uh, I, just to take the case of Iran, uh, I think the opinion of American, the American population happens to be very sound, and I support it. And the same is true in, in Iraq. I think the opinion of Iraqis is very sane. Uh, last December, uh, the Pentagon released a study of uh, focus groups in Iraq and uh, reported it as good news. They gave a very upbeat report. They said, contrary to what people are saying, you know, the critics, there's a lot of agreement among Iraqis, uh, and therefore there's hope for reconciliation. Okay? And then if you read down a little further, what was their agreement about? Well, there was overwhelming agreement among Iraqis that the United States is responsible for the ethnic cleansing and the sectarian violence, and that the United States should get out. Okay? That's what there's agreement about. Well, yeah, I think we should pay attention to our victims. And I can go down the line, if you like. Uh, everything else you said is just pure fabrication, and you know it. You're <laughs> if, you want, if you want to write me an email about it, I'll be glad to give you, you know. You haven't got the courage to tell who you're, who you're cheerleading for. Pardon? You haven't got the courage to tell us who you're cheerleading for. You've made your point. Let's go. Um, so, uh, decades ago, the U.S. instituted a policy of undercutting foreign food markets. I'm by sorry. Could you raise your hand, whoever's talking? Oh, over there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, decades ago, the U.S. instituted a policy of undercutting foreign food markets via U.S. subsidies. Recently, U.S. farm subsidies have shifted to ethanol markets, much to the chagrin of... Uh, almost every third world nation, and furthermore, much to the disinterest of almost every major media uh, network. What role, if any, do you think the food, this food crisis will play in U.S. expansionist policies? Well, to, just to clarify a little bit, when the ethanol craze began, it, it was overwhelmingly cheered by the media and commentators and so on. Not by everyone. I mean, I wrote an article criticizing it. In fact, there was even an article in Foreign Affairs criticizing it. So there were critics, uh, but uh, it, it didn't take much thought to realize that uh, shifting of um, cropland to ethanol production to fuel was going to cause an increase in the prices of uh, food and a shortage of food. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a genius to figure that out. It's particularly true when it's U.S. ethanol. It wouldn't have been so obvious, and maybe it wouldn't have even been true, if it was Brazilian ethanol. Uh, Brazilian ethanol is made from sugar. Uh, it's much more efficient, and it's much cheaper. And in order to keep the ethanol industry functioning here, uh, the uh, government has to, uh, first of all, provide huge subsidies to agribusiness, and also to impose a huge tariff to prevent much cheaper and more efficient uh, Brazilian ethanol from getting into the country. Uh, the technical term for that is free trade. Okay, but if, if it's a, so it's a, it's a big gift to agribusiness. Uh, it, sh it takes uh, plenty of land away from crop production. That means that there's a shortage of corn, but also of a lot of other things. You know, it, if, if land is shifted to corn production, inefficient corn production for ethanol, it's not being used for uh, soybeans and peas and so on. So that 
gets reduced. Same happening in the third world. Uh, third world countries that are, say, producing soybeans may shift to uh, uh, using uh, to crops that will be bought up by the rich for ethanol. And that's happening too. So it spirals, and yes, it's leading to, it's one of the factors leading to a very serious food crisis. Just how much of a factor that is is pretty hard to estimate. So the drought in Australia is also a big contributory factor. But, you know, all of that's kind of irrelevant. We can't do anything about the drought in Australia. Uh, the one factor we can do something about is the use of cropland for fuel. And ethanol is not particularly fuel, uh, efficient f from the point of view of uh, pollution or energy inputs and so on and so forth. So all, all across the board, it was, I think, a disaster. and It was understood to be a, anyone who thought about it from the beginning. Uh, and it ought to be terminated. If anybody wants to use ethanol, they should uh, break down the protectionist barriers and the subsidies to agribusiness uh, and uh, use Brazilian ethanol. Uh, it's causing, an, uh, all of this is part of a whole system of uh, undermining uh, third world uh, farmers. Uh, so one of the big effects of NAFTA is, intended effects, is to drive Mexican peasants off the land. Uh, Mexican peasants cannot compete with uh, highly subsidized uh, U.S. agribusiness. It's kind of obvious. Uh, so slowly being driven off the land, uh, it's going to get worse now that Mexico has been forced to eliminate all tariffs. And uh, uh, they flood into the cities, they lower wages, which is very good for U.S. manufacturers who are exporting production there. Uh, and then they try to flee across the border. So we build walls. You know? I mean, th these things are all interconnected. Same with Haiti. I mean, when uh, one of the things that uh, Amer you know, American cheerleaders are supposed to cheer the government about is that Clinton sent the Marines to put an end to terror in Haiti in 1995. That part is true, but there's a little more. Uh, the elected gov government, the Aristide government, first elected government in Haiti, uh, was a populist uh, independent government led by a, what we call a radical priest, meaning liberation theologist uh, concerned about the poor. Uh, it was overthrown a couple of months later by a military coup, as anticipated. Uh, the U.S. had done everything possible to try to undercut it in those few months. Uh, the U.S. immediately turned to supporting the military coup, uh, violating the Organization of American States embargo that was under Bush one. Under Clinton, the violations increased. Uh, Clinton actually authorized the Texaco oil company to send arms to send oil to the military junta and the rich elite in violation of his own presidential order. Uh, in 1995, Clinton decided that the population had been tortured enough, and it was pretty miserable. I was there for a while. Uh, the, so he f figured that's enough. We'll let the elected government go back, but on a condition. <coughs> the condition was that they accept a very harsh neoliberal regime. I mean, drop all your tariffs, drop all support for local production, and so on. Well, the outcome was completely predictable. I'm not saying it in retrospect. I and others wrote about it at the time. Uh, Haitian rice farmers are pretty efficient, but they cannot compete with uh, highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness exporters. So now Haiti's short of food, and you're getting food rights. Yeah, predictably. That's the consequence of following such policies. Uh, it, and it, again, it doesn't take genius to figure them out. It's kind of like an elementary school student can figure it out. Uh, and this is happening in many places. So your point is very significant. Uh, there is a major food crisis, and we're, doing, we're not helping. No. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hi. First of all, thanks. I, I want to thank you a lot for uh, all the uh, intellectual uh, inspiration. Uh, all these matters are a lot more interesting now that they make sense. And, uh, uh, I've been following the news a lot lately with Iraq, and it seems like there's some deal of uh, escalation going on in Iraq. And um, like a few weeks ago, Vice President Cheney made a major trip to the Middle East, and uh, shortly thereafter, the Iraqi government commenced a, a large-scale offensive against Sadr's forces in Basra, and uh, subsequently there was more large-scale large um, action against Sadr's forces in Sadr City in Baghdad. And uh, there was an interesting... Uh, phrase that was used in an article I saw. There are Iraqi tanks uh, attacking Sadr City. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the list. It was interesting that they used the phrase Iraqi tanks, which are storming yeah. Sadr City. 
But um, I was thinking about this, and it seems like our, our policy on the war in Iraq has been almost remarkably restrained. It seems like we've been concentrating mostly on like the green zone and the oil infrastructure. And so given these recent escalations, I was wondering if you thought uh, perhaps we're going to attempt to ferment some kind of like increased violence and bloodbath and may perhaps use that as an, uh, a pretext for additional action in Iran. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. Well, you're right that the war in Iraq is restrained by comparative standards. Uh, killed a hundred, couple hundred thousand people, maybe over a million, may have destroyed the country forever. It's worse than the Mongol invasions and so on. Yeah, but that's restrained. For example, it's nothing like the attack on Vietnam. I'm not even close. Uh, the Iraq war has never reached the scale of Vietnam in about 1965. You know, uh, at that time there was no protest. Uh, but uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One reason is that the American population is much more strongly opposed to aggression than it was in the 1960s. That's part of the civilizing effect of the, 19, of the activism in the 60s. It had a big effect on the population, on all kind of things. Uh, support for uh, civil rights, for women's rights, uh, uh, this, uh, the environmental movement, uh, you know, all uh, the kinds of things I was quoting about the uh, American Indians. Those were standard attitudes in the 60s, not even questioned. Uh, the kind of things that kids were reading in school texts, say my own children in the late 60s, you couldn't find in the most backward, crazed part of the country today. It wouldn't be permissible. All, right, all of this is a civilizing effect. That's why the 60s are constantly condemned as the time of troubles, you know, kids going crazy and so on. They committed a crime. They civilized the country. Uh, and one of the uh, forms of civilization was opposition to aggression. So contrary to what is commonly said, protest against the Iraq War is far beyond protest against the Vietnam War at any comparable stage. Uh, the, uh, at this stage of the Vietnam War, there was no talk about withdrawal. In fact, the first book on withdrawal was written by Howard Zinn, who you know, and it was, I think, 1967. That's the time when there was you know, half a million American troops there, the countries had been torn to shreds, extended to the, and, and that could barely be mentioned because it was so far out. Actually, he asked me to write a review of it, which I did in Ramparts because nobody would mention. Uh, well, now, at a much lower stage of aggression in Iraq, uh, every can everyone has to say something about withdrawal. Maybe they don't mean it, but they have to say something, you know. Uh, that's uh, a big change. So one reason why there is, why it's, restrained by comparative standards is uh, there's just way more opposition. I mean, after all, the Iraq War is the first war in the history of Western imperialism that was massively protested before it was officially inaugurated. And that's never happened before, not that I can think of. So that's one factor. But there's another more important factor. Uh, Vietnam didn't matter much to the United States. I mean, if the country was wiped off the map, the US didn't care. I mean, Eisenhower tried to build up some support for his early stage of the war by talking about tin and rubber and so on, but that was a joke. I mean, Vietnam had no resources of significance to the United States. The concern about Vietnam was what I mentioned, the virus infection theory. There was deep concern that successful independent development in Vietnam might spur others to take on the same efforts uh, the, virus, the rot might spread to Thailand, maybe to Indonesia, maybe even to Japan, which was called the super domino by John Dower, a leading Japan historian. Uh, Japan might have to accommodate to an independent Southeast Asia. That would have meant the United States had lost the Pacific War, which they weren't prepared to do in 1950. So there was a concern about Vietnam, but it had nothing to do with its resources. And in fact, that the concern was overcome just by wiping the place out. So the U.S. basically won the war. In, in the 1970s, didn't achieve its maximal objectives, but it did satisfy its basic war aims. You can't destroy Iraq. It's far too valuable. I mean, Iraq has probably the second largest energy resources in the world. Uh, they're very cheap and easily available. It's not like Alberta tar sands. You stick a pipe in the sand and you know the oil gushes out. And it's right at the heart of the major energy producing section of the world. That's a valuable asset, not like Vietnam. Uh, so, yes, there's got to be a limit on the destructiveness. You can't destroy an asset that you want to maintain. And the U.S. does want to maintain it. Uh, today it happens that 
I, I just took a look at the morning newspaper. Christian Science Monitor has a front page article on the opening of what's called the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. I mean, the embassy is not like any embassy in the world. It's the size of the Vatican. It has 21 <laughs> buildings. It's an entirely self-contained city inside the green, you know, inside the protected area of Baghdad. I mean, they're not building that in order to tear it down. Uh, the major air bases that are building, that are being built around uh, uh, Iraq, are huge facilities, and they are not being built with the intent of tearing them down. And they're supported by the Democrats; they fund them. Uh, and the idea, it clearly, is to try to figure out some way to establish a client government, which will be. Uh, uh, be able to function, but, but uh, much like the government in Chechnya functions, you know, they're Chechens, they have their own security forces, or like, say, the Vichy government under the Nazis. It was a French government, French security forces, you know, French police, uh, French officials, and so on. The Germans sort of hanging around in the background. Actually, it's pretty much the way Russia, the Russians most run, ran most of Eastern Europe. It was Czech troops, uh, Polish troops, and so on and so forth. So try to set up something like that, the traditional imperial structure, but making sure that it's a base for U.S. power and that the U.S. controls it. And we don't really have to debate this any longer because it's public. Uh, not much of a fuss was made about it. In fact, I don't even think it was reported. But in November, last November, uh, there was a declaration, uh, an agreement by George Bush and what's called the Iraqi government, uh, which is uh, you know, a little enclave inside the green zone, never gets outside it, which we call the Iraqi government, the client government that follows our orders. So an agreement was made between them, uh, which is interesting. It uh, permits the U.S. to maintain effectively permanent military uh, bases and operations inside Iraq. Uh, has all kind of pretexts, but that's what it amounts to. And rather brazenly, to my surprise, uh, it says that the Iraqi economy must be open to foreign investment, uh, privileging U.S. investors. That's unusual. It's unusual to see such a brazen statement of crass imperialism. You know, the U.S. The Iraqi economy means oil. They don't, nobody cares about the asparagus they grow. So uh, the, it must be open to foreign investment, unlike other uh, countries which have controlled their own resources. Uh, and in, it must privilege U.S. investors. I mean, you know, that's more extreme than the most extreme war critic ever said. And Bush underscored it uh, in one of his many hundreds of signing statements a couple of months later in January. Uh, in which he said that he would, uh, he signed some legislation, but he said, I'm not going to live up to it. Uh, in fact, I'll, I won't live up to any legislation that uh, interferes with the U.S. goal of maintaining sort of permanent capacity for military operations there and uh, uh, controls the uh, energy resources. Well, that's totally different from Vietnam. It didn't, the U.S. didn't care. Once the country was destroyed, and Laos was destroyed, and Cambodia was destroyed. The U.S. didn't care very much what happened. Happy to pull out. This is just a completely different situation, both domestically and in terms of the geopolitics of it. I'm tempted to ask a follow-up, but I think I'll see it to the other people that are waiting. For you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your book, Manufacturing Consent, and uh, I was just curious. Uh, over the last couple of days, the mainstream media has uh, gotten behind uh, this irrefutable evidence that uh, North Korea has uh, built a nuclear reactor in Syria and uh, that Israel was able to uh, successfully wipe it out. I was kind of curious to hear your take on that and maybe cut through, or yeah. cut through the propaganda. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Actually, I've written about it a little, if you're interested, and I'll give you some references. But, uh, I happened to be listening to NPR on the way in here, the evening news, and uh, you know, they had a, one of their sober intellectual reports, uh, which was a perfect example of what John Burns was describing, how you have to cheer for the home team. It described about half the story. Uh, it said that uh, you know, this, all of this is very interesting evidence that uh, North Korea isn't living up to its obligations, and then there are the hawks who say we should, you know, break all, up all discussion and attack them or something, and the doves who say maybe we should give them a little more time and so on. 
Well, yeah, it's probably true that North Korea isn't living up to all its obligations and its declaration, but it's also true that the United States is not living up to its obligations. In fact, in the rare reporting on this that you can occasionally find, the last report was that uh, the, United, the original agreement was that Iraq would dismantle its nuclear facilities and produce a declaration of its nuclear activities, and the United States would uh, join with the other six powers in providing uh, Iraq with fuel, uh, with uh, uh, other aid, and the U.S. would enter into normal diplomatic relations and remove them from the, uh, uh, remove the uh, isolation of North Korea by taking them off the list of states that support terror and so on. Well, the U.S. has done none of that. You know? uh, furthermore, there's a history of this. Uh, the same negotiations, same agreement, pretty much, was reached in September 2005. Uh, North Korea agreed to dismantle, to end all nuclear weapons-related operations, all nuclear operations, end them all verifiably. And the United States, in return, uh, would uh, uh, enter into diplomatic relations, remove the threats to Korea, and provide it with a light water reactor and a couple of other things. Uh, and end all threats. Okay, that would end the crisis. Uh, a couple of days later, the United States uh, carried out what the five NATO generals now call an act of war against North Korea. Uh, they closed down North Korean financial operations, which happened to be in a small bank in Macau. It was probably a trial run for what they're now doing against Iran to see how it would work. Well, you know, that's a very serious uh, attack on a country to isolate it from the international financial system, no exports, no imports, and so on and so forth. And it was almost certainly done in order to undercut the negotiations that had just been reached. And in fact, North Korea reacted as you'd expect, carried out a nuclear test, you know, went on to develop missiles and so on. And that's been the history all the way back. Yeah, you know, North Korea may have the worst government in the world, but they've been following a pretty pragmatic course on this. Uh, when the U.S. gets more aggressive, they get more aggressive. When the U.S. gets more conciliatory, they get more conciliatory. And uh, it's been running steadily all the way through. So that's the other part of the story. And there's another part of the story that's even more significant. Uh, I don't know if North Korea has been providing anything to S Syria or not, but there would have been an easy way to stop this, a very easy way. In 1993, North Korea and Israel were on the verge of an agreement by which Israel would recognize North Korea and North Korea would terminate all weapons-related activities in the Middle East. Now, that would be very important for Israel's security, but the Clinton administration said no. They wouldn't let them do it. And when the Godfather speaks, you got to listen. So uh, that agreement was never reached. Uh, and if that agreement had been reached, we would not be having any discussion about uh, whether North Korea is doing anything in Syria or not. Well, that part of the story is knocked out. Now, it's not that it's secret. You know, if you do some research or you read the arms control literature and so on, yeah, you can find it. Actually, I've written about it too and have others. But it's certainly not the headline where it ought to be. It's not something that people know. Uh, another small point was made by... Uh, Andrew Cordesman is one of the leading uh, Middle East uh, security specialists in the United States who suggested that maybe this whole flap is just a warning to Iran, uh, saying, you know, we got our eyes on you. Uh, and if you do anything, or even if you don't do anything, we'll pretend that you did and you're in trouble, you know. And so, yes, there's a lot to the story. But uh, exactly what's going on, we don't know and probably won't know until declassified documents come out someday if they ever do. Hi, I think you're, I've read your books and I think you're excellent. Um, my question is, most people, um, I mean, we can sit here and have a discussion on the problems that we've had um, in the past in Panama or Guatemala and Cuba. And we can also talk about how, you know, how we supported the Shah and we basically affected the Iranian revolution. But the fact is that most people in America don't even know that at one point we supported Saddam Hussein. So knowing this fact, how can we help educate the rest of the American public on all of these issues when it seems that you know, the media won't do it and it's 
all of this information that you say is easy to find is maybe not so easy for the average person. So. Yeah. See, I, uh, first of all, let's talk, you're right about supporting Saddam Hussein, but very few people know the extent of the support. I mean, for, uh, in 1982, yeah, Saddam Hussein was hanged re a couple of months ago, or a year ago, whatever it was. And if you look, he was hanged for crimes that he committed in 1982. He was alleged to have uh, ordered the killing of 150 or so people, which by his standards was like, you know, toothpick on a mountain. But that's what he was judged for. But it was kind of interesting to see the uh, commentary on it. Something else happened in 1982. In 1982, the Reagan administration removed Iraq from the list of states supporting terror, which is a name for the list of states we want to go after. Uh, it has nothing to do with supporting terror. So they removed it from the list in order that the U.S. could start uh, providing aid and support to their friend Saddam Hussein. Uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld went shortly afterwards to you know, sign the friendly agreement. And through the 1980s, the U.S. was one of a number of states who uh, supported, uh, gave support to Saddam Hussein. A lot of it was agricultural support, which he desperately needed, and it was a big boon to U.S. agribusiness, uh, but also uh, weapon support, you know, means to develop weapons of mass destruction and so on. This went on right through Saddam Hussein's worst atrocities, you know, the Halabja massacres, uh, uh, the, the Anfal massacres, you know, everything. Uh, use of chemical weapons it went all the way through. Not a, I mean, there was some protest. Congress protested now and then, but Reagan vetoed any effort to uh, do anything about it. Uh, George Bush, number one, came along. He was a particular admirer of Saddam. Uh, in 1989, at the very time of the invasion of Panama, just as the invasion of Panama was going on, uh, Bush overrode uh, the Treasury Department and authorized new aid to his friend, Saddam Hussein. The press cooperated by not reporting it. Uh, in, also in 1989, Bush uh, invited Ira Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States to get advanced training in weapons production, nuclear weapons production. Okay, that's also 1989. Early 1990, uh, Bush sent a high-level senatorial delegation to Iraq led by Bob Dole, Republican Senate Majority Leader, who was then presidential candidate a couple of years later. And the goal, the purpose of the delegation was to uh, send George Bush's uh, good wishes to his friend Saddam uh, to ensure him that he could disregard uh, the kind of protests he hears now and then from the American press. We have this free press thing here, and we can't shut all these guys up. And told him that he would, they would take off uh, from the Voice of America anybody who was criticizing him. That was generally kind of a love session. That was April 1990. Okay, a couple of months later, Saddam Hussein disobeyed orders, or maybe misunderstood orders, which is possible, and invaded Kuwait. Okay, he shifted instantly from favored friend and ally to reincarnation of Hitler. You know, you don't disobey orders. You know, like I said, any mafia don understands. Uh, that's the support, and in incidentally, shortly after that, uh, Washington returned to support to, for Saddam Hussein. After the war, I mean, the war was a murderous, destructive war, you know, way beyond anything that was needed to get Saddam out of Kuwait. Uh, but right after the war, uh, by March 1991, the U.S. had total control, military control of the region, control of the air, everything, and there was a large Shiite uprising in the south which probably would have overthrown Saddam. Uh, but the US authorized Saddam to crush it. They authorized him to use uh, aircraft, military helicopters, and so on to crush the uprising, killing probably tens of thousands of uh, Shiites in the south. Uh, uh, general, uh, what was his name, Schwarzkopf, who was a general, said later that he was fooled by Saddam. Uh, he didn't realize that when he authorized Saddam to use military aircraft, he'd actually use them. So kind of, you know, we were tricked. Uh, but uh, it was explained pretty open, pretty frankly, by the New York Times, the chief diplomatic correspondent, Thomas Friedman. A chief diplomatic correspondent means State Department spokesperson in the New York Times, just relays State Department propaganda. Uh, he said, uh, he wrote a clear column, he said, the, he said the best of all possible worlds, he supported the decision to allow Saddam to crush the uprising. Uh, 
Uh, he said, the best of all worlds for the United States would be an iron-fisted military junta ruling Iraq just the way Saddam did, but with a different name, because he's now kind of embarrassment. And so we have to settle for second best, you know, Saddam himself. Uh, the Middle East correspondent for the New York Times, who's still there, still their top Middle East correspondent, uh, Alan Cowell, he said, well, you know, it's kind of unpleasant watching all these people get massacred. He said, but there's a, a, a consensus among the United States and its allies, namely Britain and Saudi Arabia, uh, that the uh, best hope for stability in Iraq is Saddam Hussein, not the people who are trying to overthrow him. Okay, so therefore we have to let Saddam crush the uprising that might have overthrown him. The stability ha is a technical term. It means following U.S. orders. Okay, so that's stability, and Saddam's more hopeful for stability than uh, Iraqis. In fact, what I've said is, you know, the worst possible outcome is that Iraqis might rule Iraq. We're not going to allow that. Uh, independent nationalism is not to be accepted. That's why Muqtad al-Sadr is a renegade and so on. And in fact, through the 90s, it's the same story. If you look at the main effect of the sanctions, Clinton's sanctions, I mean, they were murderous and destructive, but they strengthened Saddam Hussein. They undermined opposition to him. They compelled the population to rely on him for survival, which is probably the reason he wasn't overthrown. You know, otherwise, he probably would have had the same fate as uh, Ceausescu and Suharto and Mobutu and a whole bunch of gangsters, not very different from him, who the US supported until the end. Uh, but, uh, in fact, that's exactly what was said by uh, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponek, the two uh, uh, directors of the uh, uh, Oil for Food program, who, as I said, knew more about Iraq than certainly any Westerner. So maybe so, you know, it's, uh, but it's crucial that Iraqis not rule Iraq. Uh, so, uh, yes, there was support. Now, how do we get any of this stuff to the American people? Well, you know, how do you get anything else to the population? Uh, was it you who quoted Margaret Mead at the beginning? Yeah, that's the way you do it. Uh, everything happens exactly the way you said. Exactly, in, uh, you know, take the civil rights movement, uh, the women's movement, uh, the anti Vietnam anti war movement. Pick anything you like. Uh, the, you know, the environmental movement it starts with small groups of people doing things, and gradually it grows. And finally, it gets to the point where, uh, as in the case of the anti Vietnam war movement where the government was afraid to send troops because they'd need them for civil disorder control. All that happened within about two years. You know? uh, yeah. And it just changed the world. I mean, a striking example is the women's movement. You know, it's not that, I mean, there were feminists before, but until the 1960s, you know, there was nothing much was happening. Uh, and within a couple of years, it changed the, the country and the world dramatically. It's probably the major impact of the 60s on the world. And it happened just by consciousness raising groups, uh, bigger groups, uh, you know, ac activism wherever it was necessary, and so on. Uh, the civil rights movement was the same. A couple of black kids sat at a lunch counter and you know, some freedom fry. Bus riders started riding, and you know, pretty soon you had a huge mass movement, which didn't solve the problems, obviously, but solved a lot of them, made it a lot better. All right, we only have time for one more question. Um, earlier you mentioned Latin America and the U.S. Um, preference for police states. And I think we see those police states crumbling. Um, preference for what? I didn't police states. Police states. In Latin America. Um, and those states are crumbling. Um, most recently, there was the election in Paraguay. And while we never heard anything about the generations of rulers in Paraguay, this, w this weekend there was a significant election. Very you know, we find Correa in Ecuador, who is saying that U.S. military bases have no place in Ecuador. Um, Venezuela, a revolution with resources, a rich revolution. Um, Evo Morales in Bolivia right now, as you know, is being threatened and that there is a worldwide um, appeal to, um, to seize the hostilities. Anyway, my question is, how do you see Latin America um, moving forward on its leftist path or just on its own path um, and defying the U.S.? I, I, this is one of the most important things happening in the world, I think. Uh, it's not Latin America, unfortunately, it's South America. 
Central America was so devastated by Reaganite terror, it may never recover. Uh, so they're not part of this much. I mean, a little, but not much. But South America is undergoing a really dramatic change. I mean, it's the first time since the Spanish invasions that the countries of South America are beginning to face two fundamental problems, which have turned them into a, like a horror story. You know, some of the worst poverty and misery in the world. In, in, a, in a region with enormous resources and a lot of potential. You know, it's not like, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not a desert somewhere. Uh, the two problems are both problems of sort of disintegration. One of them internal to each society, another among all the societies. Uh, each Latin, uh, the Latin American societies typically have been run by a very small, wealthy, uh, very wealthy, largely white elite, race class correlations pretty close, uh, with a mass of suffering and misery. That's been an internal problem. Uh, so if you compare it with East Asia, it's striking. I mean, Latin America has many advantages over East Asia. It should be way ahead in development. But in Latin America, uh, capital is exported by the tiny rich elite. Uh, the imports are luxury goods so they can you know, live it up. Uh, their second homes are in the Riviera or someplace like that. The children go to school overseas. But they have almost nothing to do with their own population. No responsibility, they don't pay taxes, nothing. Uh, the disintegration among the countries is that they, they, they're all separated from one another. Like, there's very little interaction among them during the colonial period and even the period of independence. You can see that in the transportation systems and uh, in almost everything. Well, those things are changing uh, strikingly. I think the most dramatic case is Bolivia, which is really impressive what happened. And you're right, uh, it's under a lot of threat now. The white elite that's always run the place is infuriated that they had a democratic election for the first time. And the US is just as infuriated. Uh, democratic elections are a real danger. Uh, but they had a remarkable democratic election in which the large majority of the population, mostly indigenous, uh, entered the political arena, elected someone from their own ranks, on crucial issues, you know, not uh, did you uh, make a mis you know, did you say some phrase that you shouldn't have said, uh, but on uh, real issues, uh, control of resources, uh, issues of cultural rights, of justice, and so on, and they won. And if they were not just uh, pushing a button on election day. These were continuing struggles, uh, control over water, all sorts of things, sometimes very bitter struggles. And they had developed mass popular organizations and they had a democratic election of a kind that is unimaginable in the United States or in the West altogether. Uh, and, and yes, now there's a serious effort to overturn it. This strong secessionist movement. We don't have documents, but I'm sure it's backed by the United States to try to support the rich, mostly white minority to pull out. And that happens to be where most of the natural resources are. And the majority wants to hold the country together and uh, you know, carry forward the uh, significant changes that are taking place. And there's also, and that's happening in the other countries too that you mentioned, including Brazil, the most important. And there's a lot of uh, integration going on. In fact, the whole region, almost the entire region, is sort of moving to the left. You know? uh, well, the US had means of stopping this, two means, violence, and economic strangulation. And both means have been severely weakened. Uh, Korea throwing out the Manta Air Base is a symbol of the weakening of the uh, weapon of violence. Uh, traditionally, the US, when anything like this happened, the US just carried out a military coup, or you know, instigated a military coup, installed a bunch of gangsters, and that was the end of it. Uh, it's, uh, but they can't do that now. The last time the US tried a military coup was uh, in Venezuela in 2002, where they did manage to, the US-backed military coup did manage to overthrow the government, but it was overturned within a couple of days. And there was huge protest all over Latin America, and the US had to back off, and they haven't been able to do it since. Uh, the economic strangulation is also weakened. Uh, the economic strangulation in recent years has been, uh, the, the instrument of it has been the IMF, International Monetary Fund, which is basically a branch of the US Treasury. 
So the idea is you know, get the countries deeply indebted, to give impossible debts that they can never pay. Uh, the debts are not from the population. They're from the elites. The population didn't borrow the money and didn't gain anything from it. But the international rules are they're the ones who have to pay it. Okay, well, that's being overcome. Country after country is, as the Argentine president put it, ridding ourselves of the IMF, restructuring the debts, repaying the debts. Argentina did it with the help of Venezuela. Brazil did it in its own way. And the IMF is actually in trouble. It's not getting enough funding by debt repayment. Uh, so the, and in general, the method of economic strangulation is declining, partly because of the integration. The countries are working together. Uh, the standard U.S. line now, press, scholarship, and so on, is that uh, uh, there are two kinds. They have to admit that Latin America is moving left, but there's a good left and a bad left. Uh, the good left is uh, Lula and Brazil. Uh, the bad left is, of course, Chavez and Morales and maybe Correa. Uh, but in order to maintain that party line, uh, you, have to, you have to be quick on your feet. For example, you have to overlook the fact that uh, one of the strongest supporters of uh, Chavez is Lula. It doesn't fit the party line, so it doesn't get reported. Uh, after Lula in Brazil, after he was his second, after he was reelected, his first act practically was to fly to Caracas uh, to support uh, Chavez in his electoral campaign and to uh, dedicate a joint Venezuelan uh, uh, Brazilian project. There's now more projects developing. Uh, shortly after that, there was a very important meeting of the Latin American presidents in uh, Cochabamba in Bolivia, a very important place. That's where the Bolivian revolution took off. That's where peasants began protesting the World Bank uh, U.S. programs to privatize water, uh, which means water's out of, con you know, people can't drink because they can't pay the cost. So they threw out, uh, they succeeded in throwing out the Bechtel Corporation and blocking the efforts. It wasn't easy. A lot of people got killed. Uh, that's Cochabamba. It's a real symbol. So that's where the Latin American presidents met. It was December 2006. And they made interesting plans, joint plans, for a European Union-type uh, integration and actually taking steps towards it. Uh, and the U.S. Is just doesn't have much that it can do about it. You know, it's lost its main weapons. Uh, now, there are plenty of internal problems to overcome, so it's not going to be an easy path. But this is the first time they're being seriously faced and, on the, and with the participation of substantial mass popular movements. That's the basis for democracy. It's one of the reasons why we don't have a functioning democracy. We don't have mass popular movements. So therefore, uh, popular opinion can be mostly disregarded as it is. Uh, but they're overcoming that. It's a real model to look for. Uh, the US is by no means giving up. Uh, you may have read in the paper a couple of days ago that uh, a training of uh, military officers is being shifted from the State Department to the Pentagon. That's been going on for some time now, in fact, but they finally reported it. That's quite significant. Uh, training within the State Department is at least theoretically under congressional supervision, meaning that there are human rights conditionalities and so on. And once it moves into the Pentagon, it's just a black hole. They can do anything they want. Nobody ever looks. Uh, training and torture, or whatever you do. Uh, it's a weak control, but it's something. Uh, furthermore, training of Latin American officers is shot way up. Uh, the U.S. is trying very hard to recreate a Latin American officer corps that will be able to follow its orders. I think it's now higher than it's ever been through the Cold War years. And the purposes are explicit. The training is designed to combat what's called radical populism. Well, in the Latin American context, radical populism means uh, human rights activists, uh, union leaders, priests organizing peasants, uh, you know, anybody who gets in the way. And that's the explicit goal of the training of officers. And training of officers just doesn't mean just teaching them. It means providing them with technology and weapons and connections and so on. So the US is certainly trying to recreate the weapon of violence and also the uh, economic weapons, but it's not as easy as it was. Uh, for one thing, there's much more protest here, which is a good thing. Uh, for another thing, there's the whole world has become more diverse. So uh, the, the uh, exporters in Latin America can now turn to China for uh, markets and China's investing. There are also South-South relations developing. So Brazil, South Africa, and India now have relations. Uh, 
uh, all of this, these moves are very positive, I think, and could lead to uh, the basis for some kind of authentic independence and also for overcoming the enormous internal problems. Uh, so that's a, uh, these are all very hopeful signs, I think. 